The paper you're going to hear today is, in some ways, a little bit marginal to my um, to my recent work in the sense that it is very America-centered, and also it's a little bit peculiar because I will cite a lot a document to which I have had special access, and you will understand uh, why in the course of uh, the introduction to this paper, uh, why it is a special document and why I would want to quote it at length because it's not a public document. Um, the traces of it have been in part erased or it's very difficult to, to get access to it. So um, I start with some sound. And here is the text, but you're going to hear the voice of the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. And in Revelation 19, it says when he comes back, he's coming back as what? A warrior. A mighty warrior leading a mighty army, riding a white horse with a blood-stained white robe. And I don't know about the theologians, and I was at Dallas Theological Seminary yesterday, and I said, I'm not going to argue theology with you folks, but I believe that blood on, on that robe is the blood of his enemies because he's coming back as a warrior carrying a sword. And I believe now, I, I, I've checked this out, I believe that sword he'll be carrying when he comes back as an AR-15. <laughs> and this is indeed this image, right, from Revelations. So now I start with this man, with Jerry Boykin. The year 2003 witnessed a fateful American invasion of Iraq. It aimed, among other aims, at bringing down Saddam Hussein's regime. The same year, 2003, witnessed the opening of a Pentagon inquiry. It had been triggered by a Los Angeles Times investigative journalist, William Arkin, who had outed a rather odd lecturing tour. The lecturer, whom we should better call a preacher, and you've just heard him, happened to be one Lieutenant General William Jerry Boykin, recently named to the post of Deputy Undersecretary for Intelligence. In the course of 2002-2003, in full US Army uniform, Jerry Boykin had lectured to several fundamentalist Protestant groups in the United States and in Canada. Ostensibly, for the Pentagon, the issue that necessi necessitated an official inquiry had to do with military discipline. Our good general had traveled sometimes in military planes and had spoken wearing his military uniform. But such had not been the journalist Arkin's concern. Rather, the problem, as he saw it, lay with the speech's potential impact on public opinion. In particular, they were likely to offend Muslims and complicate the war effort. For Arkin, America by no means needed a fanatical general. Worst of all, underlined the journalist, Boykin was a repeat offender. Had he not taken part in the disastrous special forces raid on Mogadishu, Somalia, in 1993, and there expressed that Allah was an idol. The Los Angeles Times article was entitled in this sense. I cite, the Pentagon unleashes a holy warrior, a Christian extremist in a high defense post can only set back the US approach to the Muslim world, end quote. A short-lived media storm engulfed Jerry Boykin. The LA Times revelations were amplified by NBC TV. The media data it provides, conjoined to the official Pentagon report on the case, allows a reconstruction of Boykin's set pieces. He kept repeating himself on some very interesting pieces of theology. Even though he says he's not a theologian, he does do theology. Two years ago, William Arkin sent me the transcriptions of some of the videotaped or audiotaped sermon lectures. I had had up to this point, only the heavily redacted Pentagon report and clips from the media. I had tried using contacts through the Hoover Institution to get back through the Department of Defense, but to no avail. So why is this incident more than an amusing footnote in that large-scale disaster 
the United States' irrational strategy in the Middle East? Well, it is not a footnote, at least not for the historian, insofar as the sermon speeches details and their now fully documented red threads are highly instructive. Taken together, these files allow one to see how an evangelical Protestant general understands war and his country. Taken further, these files allow a comparison between contemporary American Protestant fundamentalist notions of providential history and those more remote in time characteristic of the medieval crusades. Specifically, with a contribution of a literary genre that I've discussed this morning, to wit, American apocalyptic fictions, General Jerry Boykin's case allows to address the following themes. What is the enemy? What is spiritual warfare? What is an elect nation, and how can it remain pure? What does it mean to war at the end of times? Our first question is thus, what then is the enemy for fundamentalist Protestant America, and what sort of a war does one wage under the Star Spangled Banner, a banner that has repeatedly over the course of the 19th and 20th century been associated with the Banner of Christ. If one reads the, the Protestant newspapers, for example, right before and during the invasion of Cuba or during the conquest of the Philippines, one sees this equation of a Christian flag and the American flag. So what is the enemy? I will cite here Boykin's typical 2003 presentation. There are many versions of what I'm going to cite, but it all comes back to the same thing. He shows a slide of bin Laden, and he asks, I can't imitate his voice, alas, <laughs> uh, is he really the enemy? Can one man be our enemy? What about this guy? And then he shows a slide of Saddam Hussein, and then a, si a slide of the Korean dictator of the time, Kim Jong-il. Or how about these folks, the Al-Qaeda? Are they the enemy? And then he answers, that was his set piece, his rhetorical question. He says, the enemy we fight is not a physical enemy. It's a spiritual enemy. He's called Satan. He's called the principality of darkness. He's on the loose, and he's out to destroy us. Those of us who know the Bible, because we're pious, will detect here already echoes of Ephesians 6. More about this text a little bit later. Over and over again in these lecture sermons, Boykin explains to his audience that he has come to the congregations to recruit, in his words, a spiritual army. By this, he means an army of evangelical Christians. They will, on their knees, pray for America and its soldiers. They must, they must pray for victory, obviously, but also, as missionaries, spread the faith and guard moral and religious purity. The spiritual army has a land to conquer, or rather reconquer, the American nation. So the nation can be seen from two angles. On the one hand, first, in Boykin's understanding, America is an elect nation, and as such, the object of Satan's special hostility. From the very minute one recognizes Christ as one's savior and beseeches him to pardon one's sins, Satan becomes the enemy, and one becomes the enemy's target. To cite Boykin, if you put on that armor, Satan is coming after you. The allusion is to the armor of faith in Paul's epistles to the Corinthians, a key text for Christian pacifism, and more deeply considered, a key text in the not always so pacifistic Christian exegesis since at least origin of Alexandria in the first century. Second, on the other hand, America is a nation that has to be purified and be brought back to the true Christian faith. So, war and faith. In his June 21st, 2003 lecture at the Good Shepherd Church in Sandy, Oregon, Boykin narrates at length how American special forces decisively assisted Afghan or Kurdish warlords using sophisticated state-of-the-art weaponry. In the twinkling of an eye, the well-armed and well-armored opposing forces were annihilated. Cite him. Pretty soon, Mr. Dosso and Mr. Khalil started seeing stuff like this. 
They started seeing a lot of smoke and a lot of fire and a lot of death, death and destruction. And then he showed the slide. And that whole ridge line out there where the Taliban was disintegrated. But then Boykin passes immediately to the theme of faith, showing a soldier praying slide and commenting, let me show you something you might not have seen. There's your soldiers. There's your soldiers before they went into this battle. What are they doing? Calling on God. They're asking God to go with them and to lead them and protect them and bring them home to their families. And then another slide showing soldiers being baptized with further comments. As I said, I'm going to cite a lot because this is a document that is not exactly in the public domains and we have to listen to him if we are to understand what he's doing. If you haven't seen this, it's one of the greatest photographs to come out of the war. So this is a photograph of the soldiers being baptized. These are soldiers getting ready to go into battle, and they say, baptize me before I go to war. Baptize me before I go to war. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you these things because I want to impress upon you that the battle that we're in is a spiritual battle. So that's a spiritual battle, spiritual army to reconquer the nation, but, but the war against the Taliban's and the war in Iraq are also spiritual battles. Nine centuries earlier, in 1098, Christ's army also engaged in liturgies to win back God's favor. It was the siege in Antioch, which it had recently conquered. There, the Crusaders, and now I'm no longer citing an American, I'm citing good Frenchmen. There, the Crusaders, I cite, decreed together to hold a three-day fast with prayers and alms so that God would be favorable to them, being penitent and beseeching him. The liturgy was a prelude to combat. All thus prepared for battle, they came out of Antioch, within the vanguard, the banners of the cavalry groups and armed formations, which were organized and masked together as was fitting. Between them were the priests clad in white vestments. They prayed for the whole Christian people and poured out numerous prayers in devout spirit. Battle was met, the armies of heaven, these armies, the armies of heaven, that is, the military saints and the crusades dead, joined the crusaders' ranks, and together they annihilated the Atabeg Kerbogas troops. I cite another, troop, another source from the same time, uh, one Bruno, who transmitted his observations to the people of Pisa, who then, the letter then went to the west. As they had moved forward to the battlefield to almost three miles, behold, a marvelous banner, very high and shining white, and with it, knights without numbers, plus wind and a great rain, turned the Turks to such a massive rout that they threw off their very weapons and very clothes in their flight. Here too, as in 2001 and 2003, God marched alongside his warriors and protected them. Boykin's speech of the 21st of June, 2003, within a minute of the baptism slides, quickly linked military and spiritual strike, uh, strength. You can't judge these special forces soldiers on how they look, cause what you don't see is the source of their power. As Christians, do you realize the source of our power? We can reach back just like these men reached back to a mighty, awesome power and destroyed the Taliban. So soldiers need prayer, all the more as the war that they're waging is as much a spiritual war as a material war. In dire situations, war also offers the soldiers an occasion to test their faith, an occasion to accept Jesus or find Jesus anew. Boykin's speeches recount several episodes of his, of his life in which he overcame pain and doubts as to God's existence and God's justice. These episodes allowed him to find Christ again, and I'm going to talk about them a little bit later. But on which front should Boykin's audience turned into a spiritual army fight? As I said, the spiritual reconquest of America, a form of internal war, a form of civil war, a form of religious civil war, is its priority. Boykin explains, I cite again, you see America is in a spiritual battle today, not a physical battle. We're up against a spiritual enemy today, and that's the battle that we're fighting, and that's what faith is all about. It's about taking back what Satan has stolen from us. It's about building an army that will go out and do battle and take this nation back. We've got a godly man leading this nation today, President George Bush. Pray for him. 
support him, stand behind him, and lift him up because he starts his days reading the Bible every morning. A spiritual battle, <laughs> not a physical battle. Yet, this does not entail that spiritual fighting would exclude the Christian warrior's physical fighting. Certainly, because we're a nation of believers, the enemy that has come against our nation is a spiritual enemy. His name is Satan. And then Boykin goes on and says, well, now I'm a warrior, but one day I will take off my uniform and I will still be a warrior. One has to assume that he will still be a warrior through prayer and religious or moral activism. And actually, he's been very active. Uh, uh, the speech uh, that you just heard is from last year. He's been on Fox News. He's everywhere. He's a very, he's a media personality who is, who, who is going on pursuing his uh, heartfelt agenda. But this spiritual combat does not invalidate material arms. And here, Boykin is not the only one in American history and in history earlier to have thought in these terms. 150 years before Boykin, the abolitionist terrorist John Brown, before being hung on the gallows on December the 2nd, 1859, wrote in similar terms to a Quaker well-wisher. Quakers, known as pacifists, Boykin, what does Boykin tell this lady? Christ himself has armed Peter. In the same way, divine providence has vested me, John Brown, with a sword. With captivity, he's now prisoner after the failed raid on Harper's Ferry. With captivity, uh, 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 John Brown goes on, God has removed the sword from me. But he goes on to add that he is now wielding in each hand the sword of a spirit. By no means, and Brown was about to be hung and he knew it, by no means did Brown's passage from holy warrior to martyr mean that his first career in the armed service of a sacred cause of liberty, killing men, killing men, that this, that this fight had been merely material. It was spiritual war. So in Boykin's world, war against Iraq or North Korea was not merely physical. Like the theologians of the medieval crusade, and like before them, the pope who did most before Urban II to take the sword to physical opponents, I mean Gregory VII, the American general transited easily from images of seemingly immaterial struggles to political or military concerns and back. And if one spends time with medieval exegesis, as I have, since the days of Tychonius at least, this makes perfect sense. So listening carefully then, one hears in Boykin's conferences a constant pendulum motion between spiritual and material warfare. This oscillation fashions an osmosis between, on the one hand, combat through prayer, missionizing work, and virtue, and on the other hand, armed combat. The medievalist will not be surprised. In the longue durée, it is in no way a hapax. One finds the same conjunction in the coronation liturgies of West European kings in which the anointing with holy oil consecrates a ruler to fight against visible and invisible enemies. Understand, both the pagans and their angels, the angels that rule over them, the demons. The demons, the, the, the principalities of darkness about which Paul talks in the letters to the Ephesians. We know as well that one way in which one can think the new knighthood of the late 11th and 12th century is in terms of a devolution of the attributes of a king downward to these very knights. And with this process that was catalyzed in the peace of God and the first crusade, the consecrated sword of kings came into the hands of the warrior of Christ the Miles Christi. Listen now how the Norman prince Bohemond of Taranto exhorted his standard bearer to lead a charge. Know for sure that this is not a carnal but a spiritual war. Consequently, be an athlete of Christ and a strong one. Go in peace. How does one go in peace when one goes to war? But go in peace 
May the Lord be with you always. The fusion that Bernard, abbot of Clairvaux, in the early part of um, the 12th century, reserved to the newly founded order of Knight Templars, was de facto circa 1100 with the First Crusade, a characteristic of every Knight of the Lord. Outside Bernard, just as the Knight Templar vests his body with iron, material part of the armor, so does he vest his soul with the armor of faith. Protected thus with these two armors, he fears neither man nor devil. And to show some, an illustration of this, here is a Templar church in Italy. You see two registers <coughs> at the bottom, knights fighting Muslims, shield with a dragon here, probably not a good guy, although it could be a good guy. And on top, there is something more nebulous, people dressed in white and some kind of big dog or big cat. So two registers, one below and one above. This spatial organization is not by chance. So below, the Templars fighting Muslims. One of them is falling down. And above, the Templars in their spiritual guise as monks, their monk soldiers, dealing with a massive lion, the lion of a desert, querens quem devorat, the one animal, but by the rule of the Templar, the Templars were allowed to hunt a symbol of the devil. So this is a normal conception to think that the warrior, the specially elected warrior of God, has two faces, a spiritual face in which one fights against the demon and vices, and a material face that is still spiritual in which one fights against the enemies of the church. So what I've been arguing is that the similarities in usage of Boy uh, that Boykin makes of texts like Ephesians 6 and what we find in the Age of the Crusade is not completely an accident. It's not that Boykin, the Protestant, is well read in medieval Catholic sources. Rather, it is that despite the Protestant reform, the reading methods invented during late antiquity have imprinted the West's deep conceptual structures when it comes to war. And these continuities do transcend Western European Christian denominations. I'm not an expert on orthodoxy, but I think the relationship of orthodoxy to apocalypse and the things that I deemed to be key in this logic is different, but that uh, would take a discussion with a specialist. So where do we start? We start um, in the mid-third century with origin of Alexandria, and at that point, Christian commentators of the Bible devised a hermeneutic involving the so-called mystical reading of Holy Scripture. Origin and his contemporaries and followers had to reconcile two tasks. One, to preserve the validity of a Hebrew Bible on whose letter Christ and Paul had grounded some of their positions. Two, to deal with the disturbing violence present in the same Hebrew Bible. Origen thus posited that the letter of Holy Scripture was more often than not to be read spiritually. To cite him, if the wars of the flesh had not been figures for wars of the spirit, Christ, who came to teach peace, would never have allo allowed the apostles to hand over the Jews' historical books for reading in the Christian churches. So one was to find hidden under the husk of a biblical text the spiritual marrow, the spiritual senses that transmitted God's deeper messages. These messages bore either on virtues and vices or on the earthly destiny of God's church, including Christ's mission and, uh, on earth and the church's enemies, or they bore on the celestial fatherland and its diabolical enemies. Oftentimes, the divine message involved several of these dimensions. From the ninth century, at the very least, and perhaps already before Emperor Constantine's <coughs> conversion, one finds in exegesis 
the possibility of a simultaneous combat against vices, heresies, paganisms, demons, and against Satan-inspired humans, heretics, pagans, and false brothers. Biblical interpretation thus now allowed to wage spiritual warfare simultaneously against vices, religious deviation and demons, and physical warfare against Satan's human agents and humans perverted by vices and heresy. So now you understand if we go back to what Boykin says in many of his speeches, no, the real enemy is not bin Laden, is not Kim Il-jung, is not Saddam Hussein. It's a guy called Satan, as at one point he says, the, prin the prince of darkness. He does not mean to create a dichotomy. He's thinking in terms of continuum. He's thinking in terms of who actually animates these figures, these, these human figures, <coughs> bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, and the North Korean dictator. And this possibility to say we have both carnal warfare and, and, and spiritual warfare, and we have a continuum between the dark angels and the people they animate, one finds it with the Carolingian ninth century at the very least. What we have here also, if we look at the way in which these senses of scripture function, what we have here also is a tendency to correlate and to have simultaneously wars against things that we would call social ills, but religious ills, so reform, and war against pagans and heretics, so what we might call crusade. So this pairing of reform <coughs> and violent war is a potentiality from a pure structuralist logic point of view. And we see this coming together of crusade and reform repeatedly in the high middle ages with the first crusade and belong with and beyond with at times reform becoming the more important component at times holy war becoming the more important component but we often see them marching together and this goes beyond the middle ages because protestants may have polemicized vehemently against allegory which for them was a catholic perversion of Holy Scripture's pure letter, but this did not present, prevent Protestantism and all the West revolutions, whether religious or not, to accept that struggles were to be waged on all fronts. Struggles against vices, struggles against vi vicious humans, struggles against internal enemies, and struggles against external enemies. As a result, across the divide constituted by the Reformation, Western political culture links readily purgative war against a malevolent enemy and society's internal purification. For instance, the American Civil War of 1861-1865 represented for both North and South a religious conflict which necessitated the purification of one owns side. A religious conflict for the North, the stake was the preservation of a God-willed union and for the abolitionist northern subsegment, the expiation by blood of a sin, African slavery. For the South, it was a war against northern decadence, free love and all these things, and fanaticism. Purification, North and South, preachers called upon the civilian population to reform its mores against sex and alcohol, and the military chaplains caused caused religious revivals in the armies. But this was by no means American. One can make fun of the Americans, but one should make fun of a lot of other European nations alongside them and before them. The evil twin of the American Revolution, the French Revolution of 1789, also paired reform. <coughs> yep, not that. Also paired reform and, and, and violence. The revolution was meant to effect the regeneration of France, a term also used in America and in general in the 18th century in Catholic and Protestant notions of redemption. The two violent faces of the French Revolution, the policy of terror made famous by the guillotine and the uh, war on all fronts uh, to defend the fatherland, which turned into a war of expansion to bring liberty to all of Europe, 
a war of expansion that, that overran much of the continent. This, 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 this war and the terror were unthinkable without virtue, and they served virtue. To cite Maximilien Robespierre speaking to the Club des Jacobins in December 1791, this is a war where man faces man, Frenchman, Frenchman, brother, brother, so civil war, combined to the war between prince and nation, war against tyranny. It is a civil war combined with foreign war. It is a war of nobility against equality, of a virtue and a vice, of privileges against the common nature of human beings, of all vices against public morality, of all tyrannies against all liberties and the safety of all individuals. And against all such opponents, war would be won by what for Robespierre was faith, that is, love of the fatherland, by caritas, one would say, if one wants to retroproject into a medieval vocabulary. But Jerry Boykin also considers war as a test of faith. And now I go back to him and to his sense of personal salvation and to how he deals with disaster. And the scenario in which war is lived as a series of dangers that challenge the soldier's faith, push him to doubt, and even sometimes lead him into a temporary fall, this scenario is familiar from crusade narratives. One example, among others, comes from the Quill of Fouché of Chartres, narrating the July 1097 Battle of Doréleum. I cite him. We had huddled together as if sheep in a sheepfold. Trembling and fearful, we were surrounded on all sides by the enemy. This seemed to us to have come about owing to our sins. Indeed, some were soiled by sex. Others had been perverted by greed or some other transgression. So having lost all hope, with death staring in their face, the crusaders began to admit loudly their guilt and ask God that he might pardon them and cast down their enemies. They confessed in tears their sins to the priests, and then they obtained God's intervention, and having recovered hope, they gained victory. One can compare Fouché to Boykin. In 1993, during the American Special Force Black Hawk Down attack on Mogadishu, Somalia, there was a lot of blood. Casualties were heavy. In his sermon lectures, the general recounts how he saw pulling a truck filled with wounded or dead comrades. When the back hatch opened, the blood poured out, in his words, like water. And I, there I cite him. I cite his memories of his reaction. And I was broken. And I went and I sat down on my bunk. And I began to cry. And as I cried, I began to get angry. And as my, and as my anger built up, it all turned to God until I said, there is no God. A words that one finds in the Psalms and elsewhere. God's not real. God does not exist because if he did, he would never let this happen. He would have heard my prayer. He would have been here. God is not real. But as I spoke these words, the Holy Spirit said to me in an audible voice, if there's no God, there's no hope. There's no hope for you. There's no hope for America. And I said, God, forgive me, Lord. I'm so sorry, Lord, for what I said. And you know the moment you say, God, forgive me, you're forgiven. But disasters pile up. The general's faith keeps being tested on, test tested in this Somali quagmire. And this is a common trope in medieval holy war. Chroniclers facing reverses paraphrase a Psalm of David which make the heathen taunt the believer, where then is your God, or there is no God. But the Lord confirms his presence by means of miracles. In Boykin's Somalia case, God saves a doctor who should have died from a wound to the renal artery, and he reveals to Boykin that freshly deceased comrades have found Christ before passing away. And one sees this also in Crusade narratives, the most spectacular story about somebody who did the right thing before passing away is that of a papal legate to the first crusade, Bishop Ademar of Le Puy. Bishop Ademar was accused by the more apocalyptically minded crusaders of having failed to believe in the authenticity of the holy lands found in Antioch, the lands that had per 
pierced uh, uh, Christ side, and that had become, as it were, the focus point of the radically egalitarian hopes of part of the army of the Crusaders. And Raymond Aguilera tells a very strange story that because he had done the right thing right before dying, Ademar de Chaban escaped long torments in hell and came back to lead the armies of heaven. He was the first man as a ghost to go over the, war, the walls of Jerusalem. There are also apparitions of dead comrades in the First Crusade narratives. To find Christ is all the more urgent, given that Boykin sees himself positioned at history's 11th hour, possibly even at, as, at, at the threshold to the end. The general conceives of history as a process led by a providential and eschatological scenario. God, and not an electoral majority, has brought George Bush to the presidency, I cite him, in a time like this, as the Jewish Queen of Persia, Esther, to save an elect people. The hardcore consisting of true Christians also has this salvific role in a time like this. This light motive, as do some of his later media appearances, signals that the general considers that the world is poised at a major turning point in sacred history, maybe even at the threshold of rapture or last judgment before the last combat between the armies of heaven and Satan's minions led by his lieutenant Antichrist. It may not be a coincidence that in the American Protestant interpretation of the Bible, the story of Queen Esther, type for President Bush, is eschatological. In his notes on the Bible, Jonathan Edward, the great, uh, the great uh, Puritan exegete of the 18th century, Jonathan Edwards explains briefly the story, the enemy of Esther, Amman, is a type for Antichrist. The typological correspondence between Esther and Bush, between Israel and the new American Israel, is not the sole ground for Boykin's love for the Jews established in the Holy <coughs> Land. The Judeo-Christian, he likes the expression, the Judeo-Christian United States owe the modern state of Israel unbounded help. Yet the primary ground is not expressed in the lectures, but encoded in them, encoded in them for a knowing Christian audience. Protestant fundamentalists, so his audience, believe that the last days will open up only once all Jews have gathered in the Holy Land. Then Antichrist will come. Initially, all deceived, the Jews will, in part, see the light, accept Christ whom they had rejected, and become the vanguard of a war against Satan and his lieutenant. This element in the scenario is old and, in fact, medieval. Jeremy Cohen has recently pondered over the complexity of the High Middle Ages positions on the Jews' role at end times. They can be the collective murders of Christ and the objective allies of pagans, heretics, and tyrannical enemies of the Christian faith, but in the last day, they will have to convert, if necessary, by force. They may side with Antichrist, they will side with Antichrist, but a third, tried by this tribulation, as precious metal by fire, will see through Antichrist aping of Christ and, of Christ and enter in resistance. Several Protestant sects in Great Britain and the United States seized on this tradition and in the 19th century propagated the scenario. Highly popular and bought sometimes in millions of copies, fundamentalist fiction novels that locate their plot at the end of times also place contemporary Israel on God's side and tend to place Islam in Antichrist camp, although individual Muslims can ally with the good guys and ultimately convert. The best known and most sold is currently the Left Behind series with a prequel entitled Babylon Rising. Their author, mass evangelist Timothy LaHaye, is a self-proclaimed prophecy expert and biblical interpreter. These fictions often deploy or assume an axis of evil, to use President Bush's famous expression, an axis of evil on which one finds all of the United States' enemies. Obvious ones, but also of the United Nations, and since its foundation, the European Union. 
Unions are suspicious, given Antichrist's aim, both in medieval and contemporary belief, to create a one-world government and ersatz world religion. To cite a knowing character in La Haye's Babylon Rising, prophecy indicates that Babylon will, here comes the citation, house the one world government, one world religion, and one world commerce. The scenario that one might call paranoid also has root in the Middle Ages and in, in a very specific theology of history. From quite early on in the first commentaries on John's revelation appeared the myth of a universal conspiracy against God's el elect. So wrote Primasius, bishop of Ad Hadrometum in the sixth century, I cite, the whole body of a devil consists in all these figures, that is, the Jews, the heretics, false Christians, and pagans. <coughs> in the first half of, in the first half of 11th century, Ademar de Chaban, a monk of Saint Martial of Limoges in central France, Ademar de Chaban gave a militant turn to this widespread conception opposing, I cite, the congregation of Christians who truly believe in the faith and the congregation of Jews, pagans, Saracens, and all heretics. In another sermon, Ademar equated the Catholic faith with, I cite again, the salvation of the whole Christian empire and the destruction and confusion of the Jews, the Saracens, the pagans, the heretics, Antichrist, and the devil, end quote. This aggressive position belonged to an atmosphere of crusade before the crusade, an atmosphere that was eschatological. Indeed, writing circa 1028, Ademar recounted a very strange story located in 1009-1010. And I've given you the text here. The Jews of the West sent a letter to the Orient accusing the Christians. This letter informed the Christian army from the West was coming against the Saracens of the Orient. Then the Nabucodonosor of Babylon, that is the Emir, was moved to anger by the Jews and the Muslims. He inflicted a great persecution on the Christians and destroyed the Christian churches and, owing to our sins, the honorable sepulcher of our Lord Jesus Christ and his tomb were also destroyed. Ademar the chronicler framed his odd idea of a, of a league between Jews and Muslims with even stranger reports. Signs had appeared in the heavens. There had been famines. The river in Ademar's hometown of Limoges had overflowed. Many monasteries and cities had been burned down. Lords betrayed our lords. Jews in Rome had desecrated images of Christ. Ten clerics of a French town of Orléans had been unmasked as heretics and burnt. In fact, I cite him again, through many parts of the West, Manichaean heretics appeared and deceived all those they could to deviate from the Christian faith. These were apocalyptic signs, heavenly signs, natural disasters, civil war, heresy. And the conspiracy was universal. Ademar's contemporary, Radolfus Glaber, added to Jews, Muslims, and heretics a Christian traitor. The Jews' messenger to the Muslims was a serf who had eloped from the monastery that owned him. So we meet here the war on several fronts, nay, the universal conspiracy characteristic of the West. But how does this notion of traitor square with the notion of an elect nation? Closer to us, is not the United States of America an elect Christian nation? On the 30th of June, 2002, opening the Oklahoma Baptist meeting before Boykin's speech, the congregation recited the Pledge of Allegiance to the US flag in a telling form. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the savior for whose kingdom it stands. One brotherhood uniting all Christians in service and in love. There followed a pledge of allegiance to the Bible. Here, the United States seems coherent with Christianity's, Christianity's hardcore or uh, as it were solidified vanguard as it, yeah. Yet, in fact, Boykin hesitates about the identity and ambit of a group of Christians predestined to salvation. This may at first seem to us surprising, but it has to do with his understanding of sacred history. To look at this, let us now turn to his narrated memory 
of another ill-fated raid, the 1980 US attempt to free the hostages that militant Iranian students had seized in the American Embassy of Tehran. The helicopter-borne raid started from the Egyptian desert. There, Boykin was asked to lead the prayer. I began to pray and I said, Lord, be with us. Lord, there's five million Iranians in that city and there's only a hundred of us and it's only by your might and power and your grace that we'll be protected from our foes. And then we sang, God bless America. The narrative then jumps to the accident that led the expedition to abort a helicopter collided with a C-130 transport plane, an enormous fireball, and now I cite Boykin again, and suddenly I realize that 45 of our men that had stood in the desert and prayed for God's mercy and blessing were trapped inside that aircraft. 45 men had no chance to survive. I began to call in the name of Jesus. I said, oh God, spare their lives. Oh God, they believed in you, they trusted you, spare their lives. And as I prayed, that prayer, the door of that C-130 opened, and through those flames came 45 men running at a dead run, and they hit that desert floor. There were eight men killed that night. Not one man of those who stood with us in the desert and pleaded for God to, get, to go with us was killed or even injured that night. My faith was strengthened. I saw a miracle. 45 soldiers were saved because they had prayed. Eight who had refused were eliminated by fire. We meet here a characteristic trait of earlier Christianities and of Western political religions, as with the Bolsheviks of the 1920s and 1930s, who believed all at once in their role as a vanguard and in the existence of traitors in their midst. The elect nation here, America, is in part corrupt. It is not the majority that is clear-sighted, a widespread belief. Apocalyptic fictions, to return to Timothy LaHaye's prolific production, apocalyptic fiction presents state institutions as objectively or unconsciously working for Antichrist. CIA and FBI are rotten to the core, eaten up by the cancer of secular humanism or atheism. Here, Boykin and LaHaye sing the same melody as the more apocalyptically minded chroniclers of First Crusade, those who trusted in the imminent arrival of Antichrist and the soon to follow advent of Christ as judge. In the last age of history, Satan's ultimate and most dangerous agents, members of Antichrist, the false brothers or hypocrites, will, would multiply within the church. Raymond d'Aguilers, chaplain of the Count of Toulouse, was, as I said, the amanuensis of a circle of visionaries. Their messages from the saints and from Christ, on the one hand, affirmed that the army as a whole was chosen, said St. Andrew in one of these visions. Don't you know why God led you here and how much he loves you and how he, elect he elected you particularly? He made you come here to avenge his spurning and that of his people. He loves you so much that the saints already placed in the repose of paradise, knowing in advance the grace allotted to you by divine disposition, want to be in the flesh and fight alongside you. The dead who appeared in the battle against Kerboga alongside the Eastern, uh, Eastern Christian military saints, George, Mercurius, Demetrius. God elected you among all nations as form hands separate the good grain from the chaff, for in merits and in grace, you are ahead of all those who came before you and shall come after you, just as the price of gold is ahead of that of silver. But, but, because there is a but, on the other hand, convinced that it was in particular the poor and the pure who bore forward sacred history, this elect group, which I am here comparing to America as a whole, this elect group of crusaders was in need of fervor purge. Raymond reports how Christ revealed that within the crusading army were not only lukewarm men and women, but also traitors. Christ assimilated them to the Jews who had voted his death and devoured them to a veritable purge. He would reveal who they were, they would all be killed, and their possessions would be confiscated for the poorest among the Crusaders. This is not an American idea. There's difference within similarities. 
end time came with a need to be pure and the eschatologically minded crusaders called for the radical purification not only of fornication and greed in humans but also of all sinful humans including crusaders as life forms. Another chronicler, Ekehart of Aura, after having listed the signs that clearly indicated that history was coming to an end, explained where from came these traitors. Through miracles, the whole creation was inflamed to join the army of a creator, and so the enemy did not delay to sow his cockle over his good seed, to raise up false prophets, and to mix into the armies of the Lord false brethren and loose women under the guise of religion. Thus, Christ's flocks were sullied by the hypocrisy and the lies of others and by others' nefarious pollutions to the point that, as the good pastor prophesied, even the elect were led into error. For Eckehart and for Raymond Aguilers, then, there was no simple equation between Christianitas and the elect, between the army of Christ and the elect. I come to my conclusion In 1935, Albert Weinberg published a groundbreaking study, Manifest Destiny, and several books written in its long wake, such as Ernest Lee Tuveson's Redeemer Nation, The Idea of America's Millennial Role, and John Moorhead's American Apocalypse. Such books might lead one to believe that the eschatological culture of the United States leads many Americans to think that in its entirety, the nation is elect. So would the refrain of American presidents and officials who easily intone that we are the exceptional nation, including in particular when the issue is peace or war. I'll cite here Madeleine Albright, right at the end of Bill Clinton's um, presidency, musing about an intervention, I believe, in Iraq. If we have to use force, it is because we are America. We are the indispensable nation. We stand tall and we see further than other countries into the future. Prophetic sight of the elect. And we see the danger here to all of us. So, Bush's people, Esther's people, in the last stage of history, America as a whole, the new Israel, not quite. Traitors swarm, distrust is the rule. We should not speak here of paranoia. Like the, crusade, like the crusade, this culture has been stamped by Christianity, and one believes in the existence and might of Satan, the dark prince of this world, who to cite Paul, transforms himself into an angel of light. The devil is by essence a doppelganger, who sows false brothers and heretics in the church with heightened intensity in history's last hours. Yet, be reassured, God can reveal traitors and will do so fully and manifestly at the last judgment. So taught Isidore of Seville in the seventh century. Many among those who now seem to be elect and holy may perish on judgment day, for as the prophet Amos says, the Lord will summon a trial by fire and the abyss will devour much and eat part of God's house. My point has not been to collapse George W. Bush's America and Crusader Europe. At the very least, the crusading idea was omnipresent in Europe between 1100 and 1600, whereas the kind of Protestant fundamentalism that I've talked about, it implicates at most one quarter of a population of the United States. And owing to the plurality of institutions, contemporary America is much more complicated than the pre-modern West. My point, rather, has been to underline how two worlds separated from one another by centuries shared some common conceptions. The comparison allows one to understand better the cultural logic operating in both. In particular, what is a history governed by God's spirit and oriented to end times. I thank you for your attention. Thank you.